Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea is recognized around the world for its rapid development. What is perhaps lesser known is that Korea is arguably the only country to have fully transitioned from aid recipient to aid donor. It is now actively promoting its development model abroad and belongs to the select group of countries shaping the global development agenda. We sat down with Professor Ian Watson, who has done extensive research on Korea as an actor in international development. Ian Watson is assistant professor at the Department of International Development and Cooperation at Aju University in Suwon. He was visiting fellow at the Center on Migration, Policy and Society at Oxford University in 2013 and worked as a consultant for RAND Corporation. Professor Watson has published extensively in a variety of academic journals. His book, Foreign Aid and Emerging Powers, was released this year. He previously taught politics at the University of Durham and University of Newcastle, where he received his PhD. Professor Watson, welcome to Korea in the World. Thank you, it's great to be here. What brought you to Korea and why did you specialize in Korean official development assistance policies? Well, I was invited to Korea in um, 2008. Uh, I was working, uh, teaching at Durham University in the UK and uh, working with some NGOs in the UK as well. And I got invited to come over here do some teaching. Um, and I've always been intrigued by the Korean development model, a miracle on the hand. Um, I think it was something that many countries could learn. Uh, Korea, of course, being the first nation to translate itself from a recipient into, into a donor. And I also was intrigued by Korean culture as well. I want to experience some of, some of Korean culture. I heard a lot about it. Um, so I said, yes, I'd like to come to Korea, and I'm still here many years later. You just mentioned South Korea's economic success. Um, we very often hear the term the miracle on the Han. Can you maybe explain what is that miracle about? What is so special about the Korean development story? Well, the Korean development story, if we take this back to the early 1960s, was one of the poorest nations in the world, and I think, obviously, the obvious reasons the Korean War and the aftermath and a lot of political instability. Um, and I think statistics have shown that in the early 1960s, many sub-Saharan African countries were much richer and, and wealthier than Korea was. So really, Korea had a pretty bad start. And by Korea, of course, I mean South Korea, because at that time, North Korea was actually doing better economically. And then President Park uh, Chung-hee in 1961 basically had this plan to really you know, pull Korea, South Korea into development. And this happened over 10, 15 year period, uh, heavy industrialization. Uh, maybe we'll talk about developmentalism a little bit later on. And this became known as a miracle on the Han. Uh, a lot of the, the building around the Han River, obviously. And the Han River also is so very, very symbolic uh, of South Korea. And this is really bringing South Korea into the, the new industrial age. Um, so a lot of economic changes, a lot of social and political changes, obviously, as well. A lot of South Koreans at the moment talk about the second miracle of the Han, because as you, as you know, General Park's daughter, uh, Park Geun-hye, is, is president now. So she talks about, a lot about the second miracle. And of course, as Korea rapidly developed as an East Asian tiger to compete with Japan and, and other Asian countries, there was this great sense of, of national pride uh, within Korea. And the miracle in the Han is basically a, a word to describe this, although, of course, it, it's not a miracle in the traditional sense because a lot of hard work went into this development plan. So sometimes the word can be used or misused, but I think it's a fair reflection of uh, where South Korea has been, where South Korea is going. I think the, the question here is, is it an actionable model for developing countries today? Because the Korean story is, of course, amazing as such, but it's also a Korean story. Can you really export this model? Isn't it not related to the Korean history and the Korean, uh, I would say, legacy, maybe from its Japanese colonial past? Yes, I think this, uh, the word actionable, I mean, you could look at development of Korea and as a kind of as a concept of development, also something that actually works in, in practice. And I think, you know, the, Co the Korean development model is clearly unique to Korea. Uh, it has economic connotations, there are also cultural and ethnic connotations as well. And also the development occurred during the Cold War uh, in Asia. So a very, very different time period um, to what many countries are going through now. So on the one hand, there's a uniqueness about this. And I think there's always a danger of saying Korea is exporting development model. In, in my own view, that has certain connotations that Korea is kind of exporting and kind of imposing its model on other countries. Um, but I think South Korea is well aware of this and is, is pushing more towards a kind of project-specific approach to development, which we'll talk, maybe talk about later. For many sub-Saharan African countries and other Asian countries which are, are receiving Korean ODA, there is an issue here that 
they themselves are also going through changes as well. We hear a lot about the, the middle-income countries, the low-income middle countries, uh, the rise of middle class, Africa rising and so on. And, and many developing countries now are kind of skipping over, or I think leapfrog is the word we use now, uh, many development stages of which Korea went through. So there's an argument to say, and in, in, in some would say Korea is the, the, the least likely model to work now because it was so successful in the past, although I think that's a kind of harsh criticism. But nonetheless, there are kind of big historical changes going on where Korea is focusing its, its ODA. And I think Korea, as, as a, South Korea as a developing nation, is, is, is now, I think, getting that balance. It's recognising the uniqueness. It's also recognising that uniqueness can be exported, but it's also recognising that there's other voices as well, uh, perhaps want to alter uh, its model a little bit and, and adapt it to the local environment in, in recipient countries. Is there a, a particular credibility in the Korean developmental discourse uh, abroad given their history? Or do other countries recognize Korea as a voice to be heard? I teach many students who come from many sub-Saharan African countries in particular, and they say Korea has a, a big credibility, primarily because of the experience of the 60s and 70s. It's been through this, it's done this, it knows what to do. That's where the credibility is. It's not trying to impose its, its ideals and so on. And I think also South Korea is pushing a, a kind of win-win, I think is the phrase we use now to describe Korean ODA, that both sides are going to win. This is a, a mutual partnership idea. And this was very much part of the Korean Busan conference in, in 2011, which is focusing on the kind of the, 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 the shared partnership, the mutual experience. And a lot of Korean ODA, of course, is going to those countries which provided a lot of aid to Korea during the Korean War, uh, the South Korea, the United Nations and so on. So there is, there is an element there of a, of a kind of mutual experience going back. On the other hand, the credibility question, I think sometimes South Korea pushes it a little bit. I think there's a, an element here of, of competition with Japan and China, inevitably. And I think sometimes, I think the UNDP, for instance, in Seoul a few years ago, one of the representatives there said that Korea has to be careful not to push this uniqueness too much. And we begin to see a little bit of a backlash about that argument. But nevertheless, I think there is some empirical, substantive data, I suppose, or, or argument behind the notion that Korea is in a credible position to, to pursue this. I'm looking into Korean history and the developmental state of the 70s and 80s in particular, um, the intrinsic element of that model was authoritarianism. So doesn't it make it even more difficult to export to developing countries where at the same time, of course, other countries are trying to promote democracy? Yes, I mean, this was the, the, the different historical period and, and a lot of Koreans would say that you know, the economic model worked, but there's always that other side to it, the authoritarian side to it. And I think that's a very valid criticism. Um, on the other hand, I think a lot of developing nations are saying, well, even though we live in the new era now, and clearly authoritarianism is, is gradually on the, on the wane, if you like, but there's, there's an element here where it, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to jettison everything about the Korean development model. And I think the Korean diplomats and Korean ODA people themselves realise that that's, that's always the, the one that comes up, the authoritarianism. And I don't think we, we can deny the significance of that, but the world has changed now. And I think if we look back at the development model itself, yes, authoritarianism played a part in that, but also developmentalism itself was a, a, a very successful economic model. And we can kind of separate the two a little bit. And I think that's what many recipient countries are doing, they're kind of separating the politics and economics and saying, we can get a little bit from this economic model. Uh, we can apply it to our countries, but it doesn't necessarily mean we have to import the authoritarian and authoritarianism of the of the Korean development model. But at the same time, is it fair to say that on the Korean side, authoritarianism was the price to be paid for development, and thus they would be still likely to support a rogue country, for example, if there is a true, you know, developmental result at the end. Yes, I think I think a lot of Korean economists and, and, and Korean professors in political science say that, that is the price to be paid. And I've noticed a lot of Korean professors say to many students from recipient countries, just wait, it takes time. But I think this is the point I raised earlier, but the time has changed now. And I think the, the kind of economic development model is being used, but in a, in a very unique and specific way in different recipient countries. It's not simply being exported. But of course, the difficulty is that the development model itself is, is coming under a lot of stress now in, in Korea. And I think this is a really big issue now for the economic credibility of Korea. Uh, many commentators are saying now that maybe Korea should focus more on domestic matters rather than extend itself 
into into ODA. And of course, this is a tension of inquiry between the, the economic development of Korea, but also the diplomatic pressure to create a global Korea, to create soft power Korea. In my view, there's a gap now beginning to emerge between what the Korean diplom diplomats want as global Korea and the reality on the ground within Korea. We hear a lot about the jobless society, the two-tier society, the two-tier economy. I think that's a credibility issue that Korea has to deal with uh, domestically very, very quickly. There's also a conversation that exporting the Korean model to developing nations more and more takes the form of exporting chebol investments that have a business purpose rather than a well development purpose. Is that a fair criticism? Uh, is there a risk of maybe crowding out local businesses or a, an insidious form of neo-imperialism, to use that term? Yes, I mean, in the interesting thing is about the clear is that the chebol goes right back many, many years, and they've been basically driving uh, this economy. And this is what developmentalism is all about, the kind of a, the national favorite corporations. We all know that the famous logos and so on. And a few years ago, that would have been the argument, but this is basically chable there, they're looking for markets and resources, and that's why the Korea is involved in many recipient countries, and, and why Korea prioritizes certain countries, particularly in East Africa in particular, for trade routes and so on. But I think one of the argue, interesting arguments now is that Korea seems to be promoting a development model in many recipient countries which are focusing on small businesses, which are focusing on value-added small businesses, SMEs and so on. And this is the, the public-private partnership question. So, so paradoxically, you have a, a Korean development model which domestically is still pursuing chaebol and big business, but internationally is pursuing small and medium-sized enterprises which are not doing terribly well in Korea. And I think the next stage of that may be that Korea might actually learn something from those recipient countries who have actually benefited from Korean ODA to create a kind of mutual relationship and partnership. Um, I think that's part of this learning process that's going on. I think the Korean government is aware of this. This is, I think, this is what happened in Busan. This has happened in the last few months. I think they're aware that there's a niche here that Korea, as a global Korea, as a middle power, uh, can really begin to, to focus on and to exploit, if you like. It definitely seems that Korea is focusing on SMEs um, at the domestic level. We hear about the creative economy. We hear about the the fact that the chebols are way too strong. So do you see an interesting correlation here between what they learn abroad and how they could implement it at home? Yeah, I think so. I mean, on, on, on one specific issue which I'm particularly interested in is the green growth issue and green ODA. I think that's... Uh, in an ideal world, if you like, that would be something that we can see happening, but let's not underestimate the power of the chables within Korea and the difficulties that Park Geun-hye is having. I mean, clearly she came with the creative economy, economic democratisation, did a famous speech at Yong Dong Po when, when running for president and so on. But she's under a lot of pressure from a lot of chable interests which go back many, many years. But gradually, I mean, this is part of the, the Korean experience, gradually there's a, there's a learning process, a win-win process, and this is the intriguing aspect of Korean ODA that it's, it recognises itself that it is learning. And that's not what you get from OECD duck countries who tend to say, we know best uh, and we can sort your problems out. Can you maybe explain for our listeners what OECD duck is? Yes, the OECD DAC essentially is a kind of blue chip organisation of the, the wealthiest, um, if you like, donors of foreign aid, of official development assistance, ODA. And the OECD DAC, the Organisation for Economic and Cooperation and Development, the Development Assistance Committee, basically comprises of some key donors, mostly Western donors, although Japan has been heavily involved since the 1960s. And they provide essentially the, the criteria for determining what is good ODA, what is effective ODA. And also some of the, the amounts, the percentages that these states ought to be giving and the kind of the, the amount that has gone back many, many years now is the 0.7% of, of, of GNP to be provided by each donor in terms of foreign aid. And by foreign aid, I'm basically saying here that this is the money given by governments to governments bilaterally or money given by governments to international organisations multilaterally. Um, so this includes aid to help on humanitarian purposes, to help infrastructure, the various production sectors and finance sectors and so on. So this is kind of the OECD, like is the, the blue chip organisation. Uh, it has its own rules, its norms and expectations and so on. It's what we, we call an IR, a kind of international regime. And of course, South Korea joined us, was invited to join us and join us in, in 2010. And of course, this is a great moment for South Korea, clearly a little natural pride about this. And in 2012, South Korea had its peer review by the OECD DAC, and, and, and there were a few issues revolving around the loan grant ratio, the tied aid question, and so on. But Korea is working on that. But the OECD DAC essentially is the, the organization. 
But what's interesting now, of course, in the last five or ten years is that we see the emerging powers coming through the Brazils, the Chinas, the Indias and so on, the BRIC countries, and they are beginning to change a little bit the dynamics of the OECD DAC, uh, who tend to be more European-based, uh, very traditional, very kind of old-fashioned in their view of aid. It's a very different narrative now coming from the emerging countries. And the difficulty or opportunity for South Korea is that South Korea tries to do both, but it wants to be part of OECD that for national pride, but is also part of these emerging powers. And, and South Korea tries to resolve this, if you like, contradiction by calling itself a kind of bridge nation. It's bridging these two different forms of, of organisation. And at the moment, I would suggest that it's doing that quite successfully, although OECD that does tend to want all countries to, to provide the same amount of aid and it does this peer review process. But many countries see the OECD that as essentially dominated by the US and by, by many Western countries, and they have a very kind of post-colonial or maybe neo-colonial view of what ODA is, is all about. And that's something that South Korea, I think, wants to avoid. We'll talk about this in more detail later. Um, I just want to ask you, though, is there a, a major difference in terms of philosophy of development between DAC and these new powers? Or is it more about who is in control of the global discussion of the discourse? That's a very good question. I mean, I think in terms of the, the development, what is development for? And you, you could say that the OEC DAC countries are focusing more on development in terms of MDGs, Millennium, Millennium Development Goals. In a way, I think my, my own view is there's an element of guilt in many OEC DAC countries that we, this is... We're sorry for what we did many, many decades ago, and we're, we're kind of recompensing a development now, not in terms of charity or anything like that, but in terms of genuine development. I think for the, the new emerging donors, in a sense, the OECD DAC does represent uh, that kind of old way of, of, of doing politics between first world and, if I can use the term now, third world and so on. So the emerging powers are both saying, look, we can do development better anyway than the Europeans and the US, particularly post-financial crisis. The famous phrase about China, that China is doing capitalism better than the capitalists, it's much more effective and so on. Adam Smith is alive and kicking in Beijing. So this idea of, 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 of these emerging powers having a different view of development and modernization, those terms and styles a little bit different maybe, but also there's a geopolitical side to emerging powers. They recognize it as a, as a, as a moment here, a gap here, not just to change the development agenda, but to use that agenda to generate more geopolitical leverage when it comes to institutions like the UN or the IMF or the WTO, the new development model, the new geopolitical dynamics. And I think, again, South Korea is very caught that it wants to emulate the West, and that's very deeply rooted in, in, in Korean, South Korean culture, and it wants to emulate Japan, for that matter, but at the same time is aware that it's still, in a sense, part of that developing nation. Uh, it has that legacy, which it uses in its ODA. Um, it's a, a country of the South, if you like. Uh, so Korea itself is, is, is trying to manage that dilemma. And certainly that's very different from the BRIC nations who have their own BRIC organisation, solidarity, developing nation solidarity, um, non-aligned movement. That's a very, very strong heritage in, in, in the BRIC nations. Korea is not part of that. But nonetheless, it's trying to bridge these two very, very different institutions, very different philosophies. Particularly in the post-financial crisis here, I think what, what's significant is that the, the BRIC nations have clearly taken off and are using essentially the development model that, that Korea was, was very successful with, um, export-led growth, low-hanging fruit and so on. But my view is that the BRICs themselves are now becoming stuck or having certain limits in their own development and this has seen the re-emergence of the OECD DAC countries. Richard Manning, the former OECD DAC chairman, said that you know that the problem with the BRICS and outside non-DAC countries, if you like, is that they we don't know what they're doing. But they could be destroying years and years of, of development in, in developing nations. And they don't provide data, it's not very transparent. So the OECD DAC, strangely, even the last year or so, is beginning to make some kind of comeback on this. And I think what we're beginning to see now is these two groups, the BRICS on the one hand, the OECD DAC on the other, beginning to learn from each other. Less ideology, less conflict, let's get results, results-based. I think that's what we're beginning to see much more now. Let's talk about the details of uh, Korean ODA. Um, where does the focus of Korea's development assistance lie? Are there any core capabilities or any specificities to the Korean ODA? Yes, I think Korean ODA, traditionally, going back many years, but clearly accelerating since Korea became the OECD Act member, essentially is in, in technology, uh, in infrastructure, uh, in administration. It's interested in providing technology, particularly in, in roads, rails, 
that's where kind of the Korean development model itself took off. Um, there's a very famous quote, I'm not sure it's true or not, but it's kind of the, the myth, if you like, of President Park's time where President Park was building roads in, in Seoul and people were saying, well, where are the cars? And his argument was, well, get the roads sorted out first and then the cars will eventually come. And I think that's really where Korea's emphasis has been on very much on, on infrastructure and connecting. Even in Korea, we can see things are connected all the time in Seoul and, and, and Gyeonggi province and so on. That's a very big aspect of the Korean development model. And that's what essentially has been used in terms of projects in, in many recipient countries. The, the DAC countries tend to criticise Korea, but it focuses so much on, on infrastructure and, and in a way a lot on loans as well. But it misses the humanitarian and grant aspect to, to what ODA is all about. Korea is working on that now. But I think this is one of the initial peer review concerns with, with, with Korea. But the response, I think, is pretty reasonable. But it, it gets jobs, then it gets roads built, it gets rails built and bridges built and so on. And by connecting, of course, what it means for Korea is that Korea has a lot of ability now to transfer and transform its own development in, in recipient countries. So, yes, there is a lot of chai, chai ball interest in, in Yes, I was in about to say, countries. infrastructure yeah. makes me it, think it, of Chebol. It, it does benefit, there's no doubt about that. It benefits the resources and resource extraction that goes on. There's a lot of diamond extraction goes on as well in certain countries, the Congo and Sierra Leone and so on. In Liberia, this happens. All countries do, but I don't think we can, we, we can avoid that. This is the reality of, of international politics. So, yes, it is strategic interest. Yes, it is chamber interest. But if it works for recipient countries, and I think there's an argument to say it works, and it's a win-win. But I think, on the other hand, you know, Korea is also very much competing with, with Japan and China. There's a kind of Asian donor competition here. And, and Japan, as well, is focusing very much on, on the connectivity question, the corridors and so on. And that's fine, but one, one difficulty, well, two difficulties maybe from this is that there's a lot of duplication going on with, with a lot of ODA projects. And also it means that those people and, and recipient countries are not connected up, are obviously more excluded. So you have a paradoxical situation where you have a, a recipient country which is increasing its GDP, and you have the rise of new middle classes and so on, but also you have an increase in poverty within that country as well. It's what many people call the new geography of aid. And I think this is a, an aspect to, to, to Korean ODA that perhaps could be looked at a little bit uh, more detail. And the other thing, of course, about Korean ODA is its regional emphasis. I mean, about 60-70% of, of Korea's aid does go to the Asia Pacific or the Asian uh, region. And the rest effectively goes to sub-Saharan Africa. So clearly there's a priority in, in, in the regional aspect. And, and many ASEAN countries, Cambodia, Laos in particular, are getting a lot of Korean ODA, a lot of help. And surprise, surprise, that's where a lot of Japanese ODA is going as well. So this, this, this kind of competition between the donors is, is almost inevitable. China doesn't seem to care or worry because China is so powerful. Uh, it just does what it has to do. But particularly between Korea and Japan, there is this, this competition aspect. And also in many sub-Saharan African states, there are, are certain states which do stand out as getting Korean and Japanese priority ODA, uh, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Liberia. These are coastal countries which obviously are going to help trade our resources from Africa back to, to East Asia. So there are strategic dimensions to this. Obviously, there's geopolitics of aid. That's a very old argument mm -hmm. that goes back for many, many decades during the Cold War and so on. So I think we can accept that. But on the other hand, I think what is new is that the cooperation between the donor and recipient has changed. That's no longer a kind of hierarchical relationship. Yes, we could disagree a little bit on where the leverage is, but there is much more equality, I think, between the donor and the recipient in, in terms of what Korea is, is trying to, to pursue here. And I think that's what the OECD that can learn from, but it's, it's no longer a donor-recipient relationship. It's, a, it's a, a relationship, a partnership, and of course many countries don't even like to use that term, donor-recipient, and, and Korea in particular just sees itself as a partner. Yes, a business partner, yes, a partner which, which helps chables, but also a partner which I think is gradually helping recipient countries make that, that break. But Korea's priority does seem to be on low-middle-income countries. I mean, I think in Asia, you think about Cambodia and Vietnam and Indonesia, the very key uh, ally now for, for Korea within, within the, Indonesia's role in, in ASEAN. And one argument, one concern with that is that Korea is quite happy to help states to a certain level of development but doesn't want those states to leapfrog too much and become an economic competitor to Korea. So there's a, a very kind of fine balance that I think Korea is trying to, to focus on here. It wants development, it wants markets, it wants resources, but not too much competition, thank you very much. So I think that's the, the, the situation that Korea finds itself in. So you say DAC could learn from Korea, but one could also say Korea is learning from DAC in the sense that there are many requirements within that group, especially on tied or untied aid. So I'd like to ask you about Korea's decision to comply with DAC regulations that in 2015 
most of its aid will be untied and grant-based, uh, because it seems to be a 180-degree uh, shift from what it used to be in the past, you know, very conditions-oriented, very focused on the process and owning that aid. That's absolutely a massive shift that's gone on, and I think Korea is, is positioning itself now for the post-2015 development agenda. It's caught up a lot, and it's responded very much to the, the criticism um, that its aid was tied. In other words, aid is given to recipient countries, and in return, those recipient countries allow Korean companies access to business arrangements, business contracts, to, to various things that go on the recipient country. Korea has responded to that. Uh, I think another issue of grants and loans, there was, some would say, in 2012 peer review, far too much emphasis on loans, concessional loans, admittedly, but still loans. Um, I think there's a focus very much on now grants. Um, it's catching up with OECD DAC. And if we can put this in terms of international relations, international politics, this is kind of classic socialising of, of a new member uh, that wants to play by the rules. And, and my view is that once it plays by the rules, then it creates a niche within that organisation. And, and Korea itself, and I think President Lee Myung-bak mentioned this a couple of years ago, the, uh, the previous administration, he basically says that each G20 country, which Korea is a member, has a particular niche. And Korea's niche is this in its ODA, its ODA effectiveness, development effectiveness, the Busan conference and so on. I think that's what Korea is recognising. It has to catch up. And once it's got there, then it can begin to expand its own particular agenda. Um, yet, I think you wrote um, that reclassifying aid from tied to untied could also be a simple bureaucratic exercise and that there is still a form of tied aid continuing, especially when it comes to the reception country's dependency on large-scale projects, which, which by definition uh, require a form of oversight. Yes, I mean, we have to be very careful on the, the technicalities of tied aid. And in Korea and the Korean bureaucracies, things change a lot, a lot of the time, sometimes seemingly quite spontaneously. And this kind of accountability question, a transparency question is there, there's no doubt about that. But on the other hand, that, that, that besides a technicality question, there is this concern that Korea has ticked the boxes on that, but it's transferred tied aid elsewhere. And some of the research I'm doing at the moment, particularly on green ODA, there's, there's a concern that, yes, on, on ODA that isn't green, Korea is doing very well, and that's classified by the OECD DAC, and it's caught up and so on. But in fact, what's really happened is that Korea has transferred its tied aid to another sector, green ODA, which as yet is still a work in progress within the OECD DAC. There's no real firm definition of green ODA. So there's always a, a tension for any country, I think, between the technicalities of ODA and what happens on the ground in terms of, of projects, in terms of what's hidden and what isn't hidden. And this is for all nations, so we have to be a little bit careful not to say this is a Korean question. Mm. But nevertheless, there is a trend, there is a pattern, and I think that's something that, that Korean ODA specialists, they're very much aware of that. They know this, and they know that they're being peer-reviewed, they're being monitored, they're being watched. And that can only be good for, for everybody as well as Korea. I think the current keyword uh, in ODA is PPP, Public-Private Partnership. How do we explain this trend from state-led to this new form of partnership? Yes, I mean, on the one hand, you could be rather cynical about this and, and basically say states are basically bankrupt and they can't afford ODA anymore in the traditional sense. And they have to look now to the private sector, um, get these projects started off. And I think it was uh, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon a few years ago mentioned that this actually goes back to, to 2000, the Global Compact idea, actually of Kofi Annan, and the, the former Secretary General, who said that business has a part to play. You know, if we talk about inclusive development, we talk about development effectiveness, traditionally we think about states, we think about governments, we think about NGOs, but let's not forget the business sector. They're not all that bad. The sector have, have resources. And they've got the resources, absolutely, they've got the financing. Not that we should necessarily be all nice to them, but they do have a role to play, and it's kind of partnership idea. So the public-private partnership, the PPPs, was was... One of the, the, the initiatives actually pursued very much so by, by Korea. But again, the, the, this concern that this is primarily Chebol dominated, that's the issue for Korea, yes, but generally, widely, in terms of global compact. On the one hand, there are developing nations who are saying, yes, we want business. I mean, that's what we want. We don't actually want aid in the traditional sense. But, you know, when we think about aid and history, we, we think about the Marshall Plan, we think about the, 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 the European Reconstruction and so on. But a lot of that was actually loans. Um, a lot of that wasn't actually grants. It was loans, admittedly concessional loans. And what Korea is saying here and what the PPPs are saying is, yes, loans to government are good. They create a level of responsibility, fiscal responsibility. But also where there are gaps, and I think this is very much part of a narrative, where there are gaps in development, then the business sector can come in 
and, and create these public-private partnerships. And in this sense, the public sector and the private sector, although in many countries it's very difficult to define where the private sector and public sector actually are, but generally government and, and business, they have something to offer here, uh, and this model can be used in different localities and different, different recipient countries. And recipient countries themselves are saying, well, look, businesses, we, we, we want our businesses, we want our small and medium-sized businesses, we want our local businesses to work with recipient donors, maybe with recipient donors, um, businesses or, or government and so on. And to create that, that partnership, the, the question people have, though, is, yes, that partnership on paper might be equal, but where is that leverage in that partnership? Where is it today? Where will it be tomorrow? What about the time on this leverage? Yes, it looks good today, but local businesses are doing well. But at the end of the day, and this is one of the, the concerns of the new donors, such as Korea, whilst they don't get involved too much, whilst they recognise national governments, they recognise the importance of local businesses, they're always there in the background. They always have a sense of, of, of leverage. And that's what the OECD, that countries are, are also saying, that... If we look at development in Korea and China and the BRIC countries, their development is not as strong as our development in Europe. And I think that's coming around a little bit now, and that links back to what you were saying earlier about the credibility mm. question. Um, but, you know, the Western nations, they themselves have credibility questions with the, the recent financial crisis and so on. And one argument, of course, is how can we trust business given the mess that occurred a few years ago in the banks and so on. And the argument against that, of course, is, well, precisely because of that, the banks have learned from that, and this time they're going to be much more careful. But, of course, that means this time are they going to be willing to provide loans to projects which they see might not have a quick rate of return. Um, so there's you know, very much two sides of that, that argument. But a lot of this, I think we do have to put in the context of the post-financial crisis. Uh, a lot's happened since then. So you mentioned a, a bit earlier about how Korean ODA policy is very much tied to the idea of national prestige, that it is a good thing that now that Korea is so developed that it can also help the outside world. Which brings me to the question, how committed is Korea to its ODA policy? Because if it's only for domestic purposes, it uh, doesn't very bode well. And if you look at statistics, I think that the ODA to GDP ratio of Korea is only 0.13%. Um, is Korea maybe a bit stingy there? Korea is, is I think the, the latest one is 0.25% it's hoping for by oh, 2015, right, right, right. which is not a great difference, <laughs> a long, long way off 07 I think up until this point, Korea has, has got enough credibility to say, look, we are new members, we are a relatively small state, we don't have the resources of the OEC that countries in terms of Japan, US and so on. We're very selective. We, we prioritize where our ODA goes. That's our, that's our plus point. The very fact that we don't have these resources makes us very careful what we do with them. That's, of course, what aid effectiveness is all about. And I think the OECD DAC have learnt a lot from that, which is why the, the Busan conference was such a, a turning point. However, as ever in Korean ODA, there are limits to that, and questions will be raised that, OK, that worked in the past, but... You've been a member of the OECD now for five or six years. Where are your resources going to come from? And we also sense, even within Korea, although this is not proven yet in terms of public opinion, I think at the moment the public are generally quite pleased that Korea is very much part of this, this, this big organisation. There is an element of national pride here. But even so, national pride has a limit. So when, when people start to, to see drops in their wages, as we see in many, many countries, people begin to question, well, where is our tax money going? which is essentially what ODA, Official Development Assistance, is all about. Shouldn't that money be spent here in Korea? And again, that's happening in, in all the big, the big major, major donors. The question is, how can the organisations, how can OECD cope with that? And one point again raised by, by many people is, well, let's not forget the big players, the Chinas and the Brazils and Indias, they have the resources as well. Maybe that, that kind of partnership could work on, on that level. But at the moment, I think it's safe to say that, that national pride is still important. The other thing I think we could mention here is the role of Ban Ki-moon. As UN Secretary General, a lot of Koreans still clearly very proud of that. And of course, the President of World Bank, Mr. Kim, as well. So, you know, two major global players are, are Korean or Korean-American. So, Leading up to, to next year, the, the, the infamous or famous 2015 deadline of MDGs, I think at the moment Korea is, is on track, it, it's okay, but it can't continue to, to use this narrative that we are a new member, but we have this colonial experience, this development experience. At some point that will run out of steam. The question is, what is the next narrative that Korea will have? And at the moment I'm not clear on that, I don't think it's out there yet. Is there strong public support for Korean ODA uh, 
in Korea right now? And, and maybe how do you explain this interesting paradox that there's more support for ODA from the right-wing parties in Korea rather than from the left-wing? This is very much um, a legacy of Lee myung bak very much a kind of the conservative legacy. I mean, he really, looking, looking back now, two or three years since he'd been out of office and a lot of criticism of Lee myung bak at the time, But it, it's amazing to think how, how proactive Korea really was. I mean, the G20 summits and the, and the OECD DAX summits and so on, and the Busan, it was very, very proactive. And I think that legacy is still there within, within the Conservatives. The Liberals are very, not, not strange in, in that sense, but, you know, Liberals, traditionally we think of Liberals as, as more cosmopolitan, as wanting to provide more, more aid and so on. But I've often found Liberals in, in Korea to be perhaps more parochial, in terms of Korean politics, much more concern of North Korea, much more concern of questions of, of, of ethnic nationalism and so on, and not so, so looking out at, at Korea's position in, in a wider perspective. And I think that happens a lot more in Korea, but in Asia as well, that the dynamics we tend to think of as in the West between left-wing and right-wing, or liberal and conservative, are almost inverted you know, within a lot of Asian countries. But traditionally, yes, it has been the liberals wider and the wider global, the kind of the Keynesians and so on, who tend to see ODA as a state's responsibility to help others, basically. But in Korea, it tended to be the more liberal conservatives or the conservatives who pursued that, that agenda. But that may, be, that may be changing. I sense at the moment in Korea kind of, not an apathy, so to speak, but a, a sense that, well... Korea is now giving ODA, let's just get on with it. And it's not really the, the big issue that it was a few years ago. Now, on the one hand, that's nice, that's good, but that suggests that providing ODA has become the new norm, so no one's really talking about it. On the other hand, it might represent a gradual apathy with Korea's role, and that's, that's the worrying one if it does turn out to be that one. There is, there is this uh, narrative in uh, Korea that the conservatives support ODA because they want to, they see it as paying back for those countries that helped in the Korean War. Is that still a fair assessment? Is that still somewhere in the, in the background? I think that's still there, definitely. There's, there's, there's a question of, of selecting partners, one in particular, uh, sub-Saharan African countries, Ethiopia in particular, provided soldiers for the UN uh, during the Korean War. And there's a lot of monuments actually to Ethiopia in, in Chuncheon in, in, in central South Korea which is quite, quite intriguing. You find these museums in, in these places. So I think what, what Korea has always done is, on the one hand, paying back. There's a kind of Confucian aspect there. You helped us, therefore we help you. On the other hand, sometimes that can come across as, we've made it, you haven't, therefore we will help you. That kind of paternalistic, hierarchical aspect, which sometimes can be hidden. The language can be hidden under this narrative of mutual partnership and so on. That can come across in a lot of ODA documents. But on the other hand, a lot of recipient countries are saying, well, yeah, we can understand that. We'd probably do the same anyway. As long as it gets results, that's fine. And I think that's how recipient countries are seeing that. Just at the, as a uh, side note, you mentioned North Korea. Is North Korea included in Korean, uh, South Korean aid? Or is this a domestic issue because at least legally or, or politically speaking, South Korea considers itself as having sovereignty over North Korea, and thus it should be a domestic issue? Absolutely, that's a very good question. So in, in technical terms, North Korea is not seen as foreign aid in that sense, because South Korea sees North Korea as part of South Korean sovereignty. And that's why South Korean ODA is to North Korea is not counted within the OECD DAC counting of, of South Korean aid. Is it a sizable amount, sorry? It's much more. Um, if, I think if you add the aid given to, to North Korea, it goes up to, in terms of GNP, to about 0.4% of South Korean aid. It's a massive amount of aid. Now, that fluctuates depending whether you have a conservative government here or liberal government here. But I was quite staggered by the, the statistics, absolutely. So there's a kind of the, the, the question here about sovereignty of the peninsula. Of course, inevitably North Korea says exactly the same about South Korea, but see South Korea as, as part of, of, of North Korea. But I think the, the intriguing aspect in terms of, of ODA is this, that if we think back to when South Korea first gave ODA, that was part of a response to North Korea. North Korea is much more internationalist. It was much more economically successful in the 60s and 70s. North Korea was part of a non-aligned movement in the 60s, 70s, and I think still is part of the, the NAM. So South Korea had a lot of catching up to do. What also concerned General Park, President Park at that time, was the question of recognition, that which Korea was going to be recognized as the official Korea. And at the time in the 60s and 70s, it was Pyongyang 
who were getting all that, that kudos, if you like, from, from, from many sub-Saharan African countries. And this has played a big part in Korean, South Korean ODA to try and get embassies, to try and get capital cities to recognize Seoul as the representative of a unified Korea. And of course, this is very similar narrative with China as well. Uh, the question of recognizing which China is it People's Republic or is it Taiwan? So both Korea and China have, or South Korea and People's Republic have this, what I call kind of, if you like, ghost states that have the Taiwan and North Korea, very, very similar. And this is what ODA is about, it's getting recognition and, and rewarding countries who recognize uh, South Korea or the People's Republic as the, as the official Korea or the official China. Some sub-Saharan African countries, in particular outside the region, often want to play the game, but they want to recognize North Korea and recognize South Korea to try and get some leverage between the two Koreas or between China and Taiwan and so on. So this obviously goes on in, in international politics. So, of course, in the 1990s, um, the President Roe, later on, rather in the, in the 2000s, the President Roe, a liberal uh, president, he really opened up South Korea and African relations. And I think that was a turning point that South Korea became the really dominant Korea in, in sub-Saharan Africa. But as an ever in Korean politics, you can track a lot back to the Seoul-Pyongyang relationship. Um, that's very much part of this, yes. Is there a cultural component to Korean ODA? Yes, I think if we look at Korean ODA in terms of its extension from the developmentalist model, then clearly a lot of success of Korea in the sixth season you know, even up to the to, to present day, in a sense, is based on this idea of, of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. It's very, very strong um, in South Korea. And the argument here is that a, a national family, the Hanmin Jok, the, the one race, one nation, and so on, that is very much a causal factor of, of generating this, this national bind which allowed Koreans to cope with authoritarianism, but to realize that authoritarianism was a means to an end, and that was development. So that kind of cultural aspect or ethnic aspect to Korean development is, in my view, a kind of credibility question, because, of course, in many areas where Korean ODA is, is emerging, these are not areas with ethnic or cultural homogeneity. These are areas of great ethnic and cultural diversity, and the irony being, of course, that where you do have ethnic and cultural homogeneity or sense of, of nationhood, this sense of nationhood in many recipient countries is a result of European colonialization. And this is very different from the Korean view of colonialization in the Japanese period. So I think we need to be careful about, it's definitely a causal factor, and I think the Korean government and Korean ODA institutions need to recognize, and they are recognizing now, the diversity, but ethnicity and culture does not necessarily make development. Sometimes ethnic and cultural diversity in, in many areas of the world can actually lead to great difficulties in, in development, and they can't be so easily dismissed as I think many Korean institutions are tending to dismiss them because these institutions have a particular view on culture and ethnicity, given the experience in, in South Korea. Let's talk about Korean ODA in a regional context. Is there an Asian perspective on ODA? Can we talk about an Asian consensus? Because we did mention this competition amongst Asian donors, but surely they also have something in common there. I think they, they, they have lots of things in common, but this doesn't necessarily imply a consensus. I think what they have in common is by pure accident, and that is part of the, the kind of culture within East Asia. One, one that particularly strikes me is this, this emphasis on, on loans, uh, this notion of responsibility or fiscal responsibility of paying back debts. I think that's very much part of, of the culture here. In other words, you almost have to earn your right to get ODA or to receive ODA. And I think because of the history, particularly for Korea and China, and the, the period of Japanese colonialism, both in Korea and, and, and parts of China, People's Republic of China, their experience of that has made them very sensitive to any accusations that they are these kind of new neo-colonial donors. Uh, I think Korea in particular is very sensitive towards that. And China as well, you know, going right back to 1974 and Deng Xiaoping's famous speech at the UN, but we are not a colonial nation. Uh, we are not the Soviets, we're not the Americans, we're not the Europeans. So that's very much part of the Asian uh, model, particularly from, from China and, and Korea. Japan's interesting in a sense for Japan, clearly within East Asia, but Japan always sees itself as a kind of northern nation, as a more westerly nation uh, than China and Korea. So you get a kind of similarity between Korea and China, and, and Japan is always kind of a little bit different. Although, of course, once Korea became a member of OECD DAC, then Korea and Japan had much more in common as opposed to non-DAC China. So again, Korea is caught, as ever, in the middle of these, of these two nations. So I think certainly Confucian fiscal responsibility, but one perhaps that is more problematic is the hierarchy, the kind of paternal aspect of ODA. Um, 
despite the language of, of technical results and win-win, there is this kind of sense of, you know, we will look after you, we will respect you, and of course, don't ask any questions. This has been very much the China and Korea view, but, you know, genuine friends, real friends who respect each other, don't ask questions about where ODA is coming from. And of course, from a Western perspective, that is retranslated as where's the accountability and where's the transparency. Right. Um, many recipient countries want to ask questions. And a lot of this, of course, is at the elite level. China and Korea and, and Japan, to an extent, are really focusing on the relationship at the elite level. You don't hear much about workers or farmers or women in these kind of elite, elite South-South relations between these countries, which I think we nearly need to hear much more from, from these voices. That's maybe a, another issue. But certainly in terms of Asian donors, there are similarities, there are characteristics, but also, as ever, in terms of the competitive nature, a lot of that is manifest in terms of which recipient country these countries are interested in, in terms of resources, in terms of geopolitics, and so forth. You mentioned the South-South relation. It seems to me that China regards these relations more from a bilateral perspective, whereas South Korea as a middle power maybe cannot act like China and thus tries to have a more triangular approach of South-South relations between states and Korea more as a bridge or as an intermediary there. Yes, I mean, China does focus a lot on, on bilateral. The interesting thing about China when it certainly focuses on African countries is that it's always China and Africa, so another country with a continent. It's very characteristic of, of Chinese-African relations. And within those relations, there are bilateral relations, clearly. But I think, you know, on the other hand, China does have this, this long-term view of South-South in terms of, of third world solidarity, very much part going back to 1974, a particular view of South-South. So it is more multilaterally based as well. I don't think we can underestimate that in terms of China being a member of the BRIC and so on. Korea, yes, Korea focuses on South-South, not in terms of anti-Western or, or anti-capitalist or whatever you know China pursued in the past and so on, but more as a kind of pivot nation. So what's interesting, a new dynamic in terms of triangular relations is that from an OECD DAC perspective, what we're beginning to see now is an OECD DAC member with a new donor with a recipient country. That's a triangular relationship. So maybe the US and Brazil and Tanzania is a kind of triangular relationship. Whereas Korea sees a triangular relationship as Korea as a pivot and you have two recipient nations of Korean ODA. So a very different model of triangular diplomacy. Now Japan sees South-South relations more as Japan as a northern nation and two southern nations, so more a north-south-south relationship. So each country, each Asian country, has a very different view of, of the global south. I think in Korea's perspective that the pivot idea, the middle power idea, again, that's classic Korea position itself as, as a bridge between two other, other uh, recipients. And of course, from that, one interesting development at the moment in Korean ODA and, and Korean geopolitics generally is that Korea wants to position itself, because it knows it doesn't have the resources, to position itself in certain niches and certain agendas where people need Korea, need Korean technology, Korean know-how, and it picks its allies and it picks its recipients very, very carefully. And this has been one criticism of Korea, that it prioritises different nations every year, so it's very difficult to find a, a pattern. Now, Korea says that's flexibility, but flexibility can be interpreted in many, many different ways. Others would say it's very fragmented or very inconsistent. And this is what the OECD are, are concerned about now of Korea, but it's, it's so prioritising, but it's, it's missed a big picture. It needs to get back on board with OECD DAC. And I think part of that may be now beginning to be resolved as we hit 2015 and the MDGs. I think this is going to be another pivotal year for Korea. You mentioned the, the Pusan conference of 2011 many, many times. Did this conference, I would say, consecrate Asian influence on ODA? Because the big conversation there was shifting from aid effectiveness to development effectiveness, and this is a discourse that we hear mostly in Asia. Yes, I mean, aid effectiveness actually started off in Paris. Uh, so there's kind of an evolution of, of different norms in, in 2005 in Paris, and different norms and values, and was culminated in, in Ghana, uh, the Accra Accords, and then went on to, to Busan in 2011. So actually, Ghana and Korea have a quite an intriguing relationship. Basically, aid effectiveness is, is the idea that, that states no longer focus on their resources. They need to make those resources work more effectively. And the three classic discussions were the question that ownership is important for recipient countries, uh, harmonization of policies, and an alignment of policies. Now, of course, you could say that that word harmonization 
is a classic Asian value of, of Confucian value. Whatever has been harmonized or who's doing the harmonizing, that's another question. I think that's a, that's a power issue. But nevertheless, there's very much a, a harmony question there. So yes, you could say on the one hand, this did come at Busan I mean, and Korea hosted Busan, clearly very, very proactive in this. But it ha there has been an evolution of these norms and values. Then we get another shift. We get a shift from aid effectiveness to development effectiveness. And in a way, that's where the PPPs come into this. In other words, not so much focusing on is aid going to be effective to get these development goals, but the question, what is development actually for in the first place? In other words, development itself no longer becomes the, the end, it becomes the means to an end. And I think that's why we get a lot now in terms of sustainable development goals, the SDGs that people like Jeffrey Sachs talk about, about social inclusion, about climate change and, and economic growth and so on. We do have to make a distinction, I think, between growth and, and economic development. And I think that's where Korea is very much at the forefront of this. Uh, the concern is that Korea loses momentum. It had a lot of momentum in 2011. My concern is that it may be losing momentum, capturing that, that agenda. That may be a result of, of everyone agrees of Korea, so you know, the agenda's there, it's socialised. Or it might be a view that Korea is beginning to lose a little bit of leverage on this agenda. I hope not, because aid effectiveness and Busan was a very successful conference. It really changed the whole architecture of how we think about development. And it was taken on board by OECD DAC members, there's no doubt about that, and NGOs as well. So a pivotal moment in ODA generally. It is not a very good time to lose momentum, though, because the big conversation right now is about the Millennium Development Goals and the 2015 Agenda. What is Korea's position and what is Korea's leverage in shaping what will come after the MDGs in 2015? We're almost there. Korea's, Korea's leverage is still there, I think partly because the way that Busan was, was marketed and the word Busan immediately conjures images of what, what ODA is all about. My view is that, that Korea recognises that it's got its, its niche in results-based, in win-win. It gets the job done. I think it always comes back to that. And I think what Korea is also doing is a lot of interest in Jeffrey Sachs's work on this, the, the, the triple bottom line that Sachs talks about. And the one that really stands out is climate change. And Korea is really now going down the path of this green growth idea. And that's, that's the niche. And I think President Lee Myung back a few years ago when Korea joined the G20 said that each G20 member needs a niche. It needs to offer something to the development community. And green growth is what Korea can offer. Now, domestically, President Park and hae is perhaps not so proactive on green growth. She talks about green growth part two, but green growth was too much chaebol dominated. I don't think we can disagree with that. But nevertheless, in terms of our development agenda, many, many countries, and, and Ethiopia and Tanzania stand out, and many European countries as well, have really signed up to Korea's idea of the Global Green Growth Institute, which is based in Incheon in Korea. And, and what this institute is saying is basically this is a work in progress, it's an open process, and we can export our model if other countries want that, but to create a kind of endogenous growth, green growth within these countries. In other words, you can economically develop, but you can also protect the environment simultaneously. In fact, economic growth can actually be really good for the environment in terms of technology. And this is the niche, I think, that Korea has now. Uh, the green technology, that's what it's going to pursue for MDGs. And that links directly, not so much to MDGs, but certainly to to the Sustainable Development Goals, which I think many are basically assuming now will be the next 2015 to 2030 development agenda. So I think Korea is on track. The main issue for me is that Korea needs to generate domestic credibility for Green Grove. It needs to show how it works in Korea before it talks about how it works overseas. So can Korea, as a middle power, play this role of bridge or network nation for ODA? Absolutely. I think Korea is moving a little bit from the bridge role. The bridge role can be seen to be quite static. The metaphor bridge always was a little bit of a problem in the sense that bridges can be very solid. Yes, that's good, but they're not very flexible. They can be walked on, they can be used, they can fall down. It's very, the metaphor is very problematic. And I think that's why the kind of network idea, that Korea is spanning out its network through technology in particular, finding priority allies, as I mentioned, Indonesia, European countries such as Norway and Denmark, very proactive in the GGGI, in sub-Saharan African countries as well, very, very diverse. And I think what that's saying is that traditionally when we think about international cooperation, we say, well, countries have to be the same in order to cooperate. But diversity in different rates of development, that's what creates the problems. And Korea, as ever, is inverting that and saying, actually, we can use that to our advantage. The very fact that we don't have resources, the very fact that we, we do have this tension between domestic credibility and international commitments, uh, let's use that. And let's be honest about it. And I think that's very much what Korea has got from this whole debate. So I think 
you know, people often write off career, but I think on the other hand, career is on the right track. And I think career has very much opportunities emerging here. Professor Watson, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.